Hi everyone. So in this video, we'll be tackling multiple choice papers. So I chose a 2012 um, paper because it actually consists of all of the topics that you would need to know for your multiple choice paper. It has all the topics in the syllabus. So essentially, once you can do the topics in this paper, you should be able to do it in any paper. So what I will do is I could show you how questions can vary, how they could change up the questions with the same topic. Okay, and also give you some tips on how to answer questions you may not be sure of the answer to and how the answers, the choices could actually help you narrow down some of the choices, right? So let's get into this paper. So the first question asks, um, which of the following is a vector quantity? So we need to know the difference between vectors and scalars. So we need to know that vectors are, um, are, are quantities that have both magnitude and direction. And our answer there is momentum because momentum is a product of um, a body's mass and its velocity right so we have direction in there i also circled all of the answers beforehand so in case that you want to skim through and you don't necessarily want to listen to the explanation you can do that as well okay in question two we need to find the resultant forces of all of these so to know which one is the largest right so the resultant forces we need to add up or essentially minus all the forces to find the final force and the direction it is going right so let's take for example a which is the correct answer by the way we have two newtons going in the opposite direction to 15 newtons so the resultant force would be the 15 minus 2 newtons to make 13 newtons in this direction in b we have equal forces going in opposite directions so the the block will go nowhere right so it's, take a think of two people pulling on the block in opposite directions they go nowhere in c we have two forces going in the same direction so you have two and four so you could add them and you will get six and finally in d again don't let the diagram fool you someone is pushing the block and your next person is pulling the block so they actually go in the same direction to make 12 newtons but our answer is e which is 13. in number three which of the following is a non-renewable energy source now this one is quite easy Right, and that answer is natural gas. Item four refers to the lamps. So they're asking for stability. Now stability depends on the the base of the lamp as well as the mass. Okay. So we need to find the the, the lamp that has the greatest mass and um, the widest base, and we could clearly see that A has those. Okay and ASP, right? Number five, which of the following is most suitable for measuring the diameter of our wire? Now, our wires are very thin objects, so we need to choose the object, the measure, the, um, the, the instrument that can measure the thinnest objects. And that one, as we know, is the screw gauge. Now, they could ask for different things, right? They could ask you for the length of a desk or the height of a door, and those things you obviously need either the meter rule or the tape measure, right? So let's look out for different objects. Once the object is extremely thin, like a pencil or a wire, you could use a micrometer screw gauge, all right? Which of the following is the correct SI unit for pressure, right? And that is actually the Pascal. Now, if you were confused and you don't remember what the Pascal was, I think everyone knows that the Joule is for energy, right? The Joule is for energy. So you might be kind of conflicted with these, right? But just remember, if you could remember the formula you could also remember the, the SI unit. So remember the formula for pressure is force over area. So if force is newtons and area will have to be meters squared, the unit for pressure will have to be newton per meter squared. So the meter squared, when you're dividing and you put it back on top, you'll get a minus by it, right? So the newton meter per meter squared. And is that any of these? Nope, nope. So that's wrong, that's wrong. And I feel everyone knows that the Joule is energy. So that leaves us with Pascal. So even if you didn't know that the Pascal was the SI unit, you eliminated all the other choices. All right, a vehicle with a uniform velocity of 10 meters per second is represented by which of the following graphs? Now they said uniform velocity, right? So it's going to be 10. There's no acceleration taking place like in all of the other ones. Everything is stable at 10, all right? So this is distance by the way. So this is 10 meters that he is traveling at and 
um, time is in seconds, okay? Which of the following is not a vector quantity? So another vector versus scalar question here. So essentially, not a vector means a scalar. And that's going to be mass. So you can actually use this question to learn some popular vectors. So all of these are vectors. And then number one, of the, all of the others were scalars, right? Force is directly proportional to acceleration. So force is proportional to acceleration. This is Newton's second law. Okay, so it's important to actually learn the three laws there for multiple choices as well. Always remember, I have the um, the videos outlining the broad topics that you could always review. That will definitely help you as well in the multiple choice, right? I'll make sure I link them in the description. Number 10. A cyclist riding down a hill applies his brakes and eventually comes to rest. So this is a very foolish question because I think most people know that once somebody is moving, they have kinetic energy. So he was already riding down the hill, so he have kinetic energy here. And if he stops, he will have the potential. But all of the other choices start with potential, which is very foolish. So the answer is obviously C. All right, acceleration can be defined as the rate of change of velocity with time. So if you remember, there's actually a formula. A is equal to V minus U on T. What V is, is the final velocity. You use the initial velocity. So final minus initial is your change. And rate of change means that you're dealing with time. Rate is time, right? Which of the following does the pressure of a fluid depend? The depth of the fluid, the density of the fluid, and the acceleration due to gravity. Well, it's all of them. And this is a useful formula to remember as well. So the pressure is equal to H rho G. H being the depth. Rho being the density and gravity being the acceleration due to gravity, obviously, right? So that's a good formula to remember there. The period of a simple pendulum actually just depends on the length of the string. There was a an experiment in the paper three video that actually dealt with the um, the pendulum, right? So it depends on the length of the string, nothing else. An aeroplane traveling at a constant speed at an altitude of one thousand meters above sea level, which of the following is true? It actually has both potential and kinetic energy. It has potential energy because there's no change in height, right? So it's tra traveling at a constant... Um, sorry, there's potential energy because there it's traveling at a height, right? 1,000 meters above sea level. And it's kinetic energy because obviously it's a plane, right? It's flying at a very high speed. So it's going to have kinetic energy as well. But by virtue of the height gives it the potential energy. Which of the following is true for a body in equilibrium? The sum of the forces in one direction is equal to the sum of the forces in the opposite direction. Yes, that's equilibrium. And two and three also say the same thing, just like one. So this is a moments question or a turning forces question, right? So all of them mean the same thing. Okay, so here we have a calculation question. 400 kilograms of methylated spirit occupies a volume of 0 0.5 meters cube, which is density. So, useful formula again. Density is the mass per unit volume. So, mass over volume. So, it's 400 over 0 0.5, which is actually 800. But if you look at your answers, there isn't 800 there. What it did is they converted it to standard form. Right? So, they're kind of trying to test two topics in one. So always remember to convert something to standard form. We need to go all we need to move our decimal point until there is just one number before the decimal point. So in this case we moved our decimal point two places to the left. So in order to get back the 800, so right now it's kind of like we have eight. Because we moved the decimal point two places to the left. So what we need to multiply by to get back 800 from 8? Well we need to add back two zeros, so that's 10 to the 2. That's why our answer is 8. What is the gain in gravitational potential energy of your body of weight 2,000 newtons as it rises from a height of 20 meters to a height of 25 meters above the Earth's surface? All right, so again, we need to remember the formula for um, potential energy, right? So this is a, a very important um, formula. It could always come, right? So it's mass by gravity by height. However, 
they give us the weight of the object already in newtons right so that's both the mass and the gravity so in this case we will just be multiplying 2000 multiplied by the change in the height so the change in height would be the final height minus the initial height so that's 25 minus 20 which is really 5 so it's 2000 by 5 and you will get 10,000 joules right um just as a fun fact the kinetic energy formula is a half m v squared all right so always keep that in mind you could always get a kinetic energy formula as well number 18 when a liquid in a puddle evaporates its temperature changes how does the temperature of the liquid change and why so evaporation means heat is being lost right so just like when you sweat and you sweat evaporates you get a cooling effect so therefore temperature decreases that that cancel of the increases and increases right and why does it increase decrease sorry because on the surface of the um of the water or the liquid um the particles there gain heat energy and they move about very rapidly and are able to break free of the liquid and turn into gas right so the more energetic molecules leave the liquid so it loses heat right that's why it cools which scientist successfully showed the relationship between heat and mechanical work that's joule right um so both heat and work deal with energy and we know we know the unit for energy is joule so that's an easy way to remember it right but this is just something i guess you had to know right so a thermostat is made from a bimetallic strip so bimetallic means that it's um is a strip using two different metals right so the strip is heated and the brass expands more than the iron so metal expands when heated if you if you didn't know right so if the brass expands more this wants to go in this direction and this direction more than the iron remember they are they are stuck together essentially right so therefore the brass is going to elongate more and cause the bimetallic strip to bend and it's going to bend in b because here you have a longer strip of brass and right on the bottom this is actually shorter in the iron right so the iron will um will extend much less than the brass and it will look like this the name given to the amount of heat energy needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of iron by one kelvin is heat capacity Okay, so this is a definition that you have to know, and also the formula actually gives away the answer. So heat capacity is big C, and that's equal to mass by small c, which is specific heat capacity. So it uses the, incorporates the mass in its definition. Sharon painted the half, half of the roof of her doghouse white and the other half black. She noticed that the one that she painted black actually dried quicker, and this is because black is a good heat absorber right and anything bright and shiny so the whiter and shinier it is it will reflect heat right and if it's black and dull it's going to absorb heat so that's why it will dry faster Bubbles of a gas rising from a scuba diver below the surface of the sea increase in size as they rise to the surface. So their size increase because, so this is the volume of the bubbles, right? So, um, so the water pressure on the bubbles actually, um, sorry, the water pressure, this is wrong, the water pressure decreases. So as you go higher up, as the bubbles go higher up, the remember pressure depends on the, um, the height density and the gravity so this is being changed right so if the height or the depth of the water is decreasing then pressure will also decrease and that is why the bubble there's less pressure on the bubble and it will start to expand okay number 24 the clinical thermometer is designed so that it's very sensitive to small changes in temperature so what about the um the thermometer could actually make it more sensitive well if the bulb is very thin right um, a small change in heat will cause the um, whatever is inside the thermometer to, um, to change rather than if the glass around the bubble is thick it would take a lot more heat to even start moving right and then the narrow bore the more narrow this bore is here 
the more capillary action would happen and actually pull the substance in the thermometer faster okay in a youtube video much like this one mr lee and his students heat a metal drum okay so it's just a a tin of metal right and they and they capped it and they dumped it into a tub of cold water and then in the video the drum is crushed so the gas law that best explains this observation so they give us all the the gas laws that you three right and then they leave the three and the combined one which is not right so if you cap the drum right it means that you're not going to change the volume of the air so the volume is going to be held constant right so we just need to find out which one of these um these laws have the volume as constant and it's the pressure law okay an electronic air conditioner man maintains temperature of inside of the office at 24 degrees so we want to know which could noticeably reduce our electricity bill it is definitely not one because if you reduce the temperature to 21 the air conditioner have to work harder to keep the temperature there however honey hanging curtains on the window and painting the roof with aluminum paint remember aluminum will be shiny it will reflect heat okay so two and three could actually help keep the building more cool let's look at 27. in the diagram above pqr and s are identical containers containing water of masses m 2m 3m and 4m at the temperatures indicated so they have different initial temperatures there so which of the following must lose the most energy to cool down to 10 let me remove this answer here because i think it's wrong right so you want to know which one ha which one needs to lose the most energy so we know our energy formula with heat it's e equals m c delta theta and delta theta is the change in heat right now notice they didn't actually give us a value for m and they didn't give us a value for c and that's not needed because all of them kind of related they all they will all have the same specific heat capacity and stuff so anything that is constant much like the gas laws they really don't need to be mentioned in the formula right so we're just focusing on the change in temperature so in p we just have m c and the change in temperature would have to be 80 and minus the 10 all right remember all of them has have to go down to 10 degrees celsius and we want to know how much energy they're going to lose to get there so it's going to be 80 minus 10 which is 70. So we just focus in on the numbers in this equation here because we don't know what m and c is right so for p e is 70 we just take in like that right let's try q right so i'll put eq here so it's going to be 2m right that's what i have for q 2m c and any change in temperature would be the 60 for q minus the 10 that it has to go to so it's going to be the 2 we all we only use any numbers right so we're going to be 2 multiplied by 50 this time so that is 100 so we don't know that q is more than um, p right so p is definitely wrong let's take r so again r has 3m and 40 as the initial so we have 3m here c and then 40 minus 10 so that's going to be 3 by 30 that's 90 which is already less than q so r is wrong and finally let's go to s so s is 4m so we're going to be 4mc and it is 20 minus 10 so that's going to be 4 multiplied by 10 and that will be 40 which is less than all of them so our answer is q not s right because q has uh, uses the most energy there okay 28 Look at this table here. So the table shows two pairs of readings taken from an experiment to investigate Boyle's law. Which of the values below most likely is to be the measured pressure if the volume is reduced to 20. So here we have the volume at 40 and the pressure was 1. Then we reduce the volume by 10 to 30 and the pressure increased by 0.3. So if we decrease the volume further to 20 by another 10, then I think it's safe to assume that the pressure might increase again to 1.6 by 0.3 again, right? So I think that makes sense. Lightning is seen several seconds before thunder, and that's because the speed of light 
is uh, much faster than the speed of sound they actually occur at the same time the speed of sound is approximately 330 meters per second which is super fast but the speed of light is 300 million meters per second okay <laughs> the list of electromagnetic waves in order of decreasing wavelength so we have to know the electromagnetic spectrum okay and it's seven things that we need to know and let me just list them for you um, in order of decreasing wavelength so we have radio waves as the biggest one then microwaves then we have infrared and then we have the visible spectrum and that's Roy G. Biv, right? and then we have UV rays x-rays and gamma rays so of the choices here they have microwaves as the biggest one right so that's microwaves first then we have infrared then ultraviolet and then x-rays so it's d okay but these seven are very important to learn now sometimes they might mix you up and put increasing wavelength so in that case you'll have to go from gamma go back to radio okay just keep that in mind 31 refers to this following diagram a ray of light passes from paraffin into air at an angle of incidence of 20 degrees if the refractive index of paraffin is 1.44 then the value of sine x so they don't actually want to calculate the the actual um, angle of refraction and just want to know what it would be if you were to calculate it right and obviously we need to use snell's law so n1 sine i is equal to n2 sine r and sine r is what we want so n1 it says it goes it goes from the paraffin right so n1 is actually going to be the 1.44 then we'll have the sine 28 that's the angle of incidence and then n2 it goes into a and you need to know that a is one right and then we have sine r and one by sine r is just sine r so therefore sine r will be this 1.44 by sine 28 so 32 refers to the following diagram here which of the following which shows a ray of light passing through a diverging lens now the name kind of gives it away right in a diverging lens when the rays pass through anything but the center it's going to spread apart right so one is obviously correct you see the ray coming here and then it goes outwards that's diverging in number two we have the ray coming here but it's going towards the center more so that is converging so that is wrong but then three you could see the ray goes straight through the center and it comes out exactly the way it was and that is actually correct for both diverging and converging lens, if a ray of light passes through exactly the center of the um, of the lens, it will not it will not change its path, right? So one and three are the correct answers here. Let's take a look at thirty three. The refractive index for light traveling from air to glass, and we have three different definitions essentially. However, the refractive index does not depend on frequency at all, so this is one hundred percent wrong. It does depend on the wavelength and the speed. So let's take a look at the speed. So the speed of light in glass over the speed of light in air. Now this sounds correct, but it actually is the wrong way. It's actually the speed of light in air over the speed of light in glass. Because they said traveling from air to glass. Right? So the medium that we want to find, which is the glass, it needs to be on the bottom. Right? Not the air. So therefore, by elimination, it's two right this is actually in the correct um, order okay okay let's take a look at 34 from the diagram above a real image is produced with a converging lens when the object is located anywhere after f okay so between f and infinity anywhere after f you will get a real image right so if you are before f um, remember you'll have to um, extrapolate and you'll get a virtual image that is in the same orientation Right, and it will be larger however a real image would be inverted okay when young's double slit experiment is conducted it is expected to show interference patterns on a screen so young's double slit experiment was really to um to show that light rays actually have the same properties as all other waves right and interference is one of them all right you could always google young's double slit experiment and see how it's done Another wave question here, pitch and loudness. 
All right, so if we have a weave, let me just draw a weave here. Okay, so the loudness depends on the amplitude of the wave, so how high it is, right? That is loudness or volume. And the frequency determines the pitch. So remember the frequency is how, how fast you um, complete the cycle, right? So if a wave is like, is like that it's going to have a high pitch or a high frequency right compared to the one i just drew there so frequency and amplitude you have to put it in the correct direction right don't put amplitude and frequency frequency to pitch amplitude to loudness right so this one you kind of had to think about it was very easy right there's a reflection question a lady faces a plain mirror which is five meters away from her she views the image of her vase which is 0 0.5 meters in front of her now, how far from who, right now, where she is standing, is the image of the vase? So, remember the property of the mirror is that um, you are going to be the same distance away from the mirror as you are in it. So, let's just pretend we're going to kind of draw over the whole diagram here, right? So, we're pre pretending now that we're inside the mirror here in this box, right? So, she is going to be over here, right? And the vase and everything is going to be here, right? But they want to know... How far away is her original, where she is right now, to the V's? I draw a person there, but it's really a V's. <laughs> in the mirror, right? So that's, we have to calculate, well, how far away from who is the V's in the mirror? So she is already 0 0.5 meters away from the actual V's. So this here now, the V's is actually 4.5 meters away from the mirror. If she is 5 meters away from the mirror and 0 0.5 meters away from the V's, and the vase itself is 4.5 meters away from the mirror. So therefore, it's another 4.5 meters when it's reflected, right? So therefore, she will have to cover this entire distance here, which is 9, plus the original 0 0.5 meters that she is away from the vase. So that's going to be in total 9.5 meters. Let me erase this madness here. <laughs> okay. A transmitter emits a radio waves of frequency 750 kilohertz. If the velocity of electromagnetic waves is 3 by 10 to the 8, what is the wavelength of the transmission? So this is a good question to remember your golden formula. V is equal to F lambda. Right, so in this case, they want um, lambda, which is the um, wavelength. So we just take F and you put it under the V. So V is always 3 by 10 to the 8. And remember, you need to... What's your units, right? This is kilohertz, and we want to change it back to hertz. So kilo is actually a thousand, ten to the power of three. So that's three zeros, right? And three by ten to the eight, well, as eight zeros. So you can actually work this out yourself. That's three hundred million over seven hundred fifty thousand. So these zeros will cancel off. So you're left with um. 30,000 over 75, so you can just divide 75 by 25, you get 3, and this will be 1,200, and 3 into 1,200 is 400, so your answer is C, 400 meters. Item 39 refers to the following diagrams of some electricity now, right? So two resistors, R1 and R2, they are in parallel, which is very important, because in parallel, Voltage is the same across all of them, right? So what is the current in um, in R1 if the current in R2 is 1.8 amps? So they give you the ampere and the um, the vo and the re resistance there so that you would go and calculate the voltage because you know V is equal to IR. And if they want the, the I over here, then you, you know you need V and R because you can't have two unknowns in your formula. So the first thing we did we have to go and calculate um, the voltage in this resistor. And because they are in parallel, the voltage in this resistor will be the same as the voltage in this one. So I got 7.2 for the voltage for R2. So therefore, I just put that into my second formula to calculate current. So I simply, um, I took the R and I put it over the V to make that the subject of the formula. So I end up with V over R. So I have my 7.2 and then I use my 6.0 as the resistance and I got 1.2 amps. Simple question, right? 
A transformer was connected to a 100 volt supply and the output measured and found to be 10 volts, 0 0.5 amps as the current. So they want to know the primary current now, and this is very simple. We have the transformer formula here, right? So the number of coils, the number of turns in um, the primary over the number of turns in secondary is equal to the voltage of the primary over the secondary voltage, and that is also equal to the secondary current over the primary current. So you have a flip there in the end, right? So they didn't mention anything about the, um, the tune there. So this is the part of the formula we're going to use. VP over VS is equal to IS over IP. So our primary volt was 100. The one that we measured was 10. The secondary amp is 0 0.5, and we have to find the primary current. So we could just cross multiply. So we get 100 IP is equal to 0 0.5 by 10 is just 5. So that is going to be 5 over 100, and that will give us 0 0.05. That will be B. Right, so let's take a look at some logic gates now. So very simple, these are the four main logic gates you're going to get, right? So um, in an OR gate, it means that, um, so you know that you have two inputs, right? Either 1 or 0. So an OR gate will just need either a 1, a 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and 0, 0. These are all the possible combinations, right? So you just need one of them to be open or, or positive, which is the 1, for the, the final um, one to be positive, right? So you have 1, 1, 1, and 0. That's for your O. For your AND, you need both to be um, open or active to get your 1 at the end, right? So all of these are going to be 0. And you end up with one. For your no, no is essentially um the opposite of O, right? So if your O was um was this, then your no is simply a change in the final results to everything that O was not. So it's going to be that. And similarly for NAND, if your na if your AND was just this, then your NAND is going to be complete opposite. Okay, so um, that is actually what we have in our table. We have three ones there, so it's NAND. If in a transformer, the number of um, turns of the secondary, um, the secondary turns is greater than the primary turns, then the transformer is a step up. So I don't know about smoothing and alternating. We just have step up and step down, right? And um, a step up simply means that the secondary voltage is going to be more than the primary voltage, right? And that's because the number of turns in the secondary coil is more, okay? So it's a step up transformer. Similarly, they could switch it around and they could ask you for a step down, in which case the number of turns in the secondary coil will be less. Which of the following quantities is constant in a parallel circuit? Well, we had to actually use this rule to answer that question um, in a previous page, and that is actually voltage. A magnetic field can be used to deflect the path of beta rays. So beta rays has a charge, a negative charge, right? So you need a negative charge. You need a charged particle. None of the other rays are charged, right? So these have no charge. So therefore, they can't be deflected or anything like that. So beta rays are your option there. Which of the following scientists discovered the relationship E equals mc squared? Well, this is the famous formula from Albert Einstein. For any two consecutive elements in the periodic table, the first element has one less proton. So this is a very complicated way of asking a very simple question. So any two consecutive elements, so hydrogen and then helium. So you know hydrogen is um has just one atomic number and helium has two, right? So what really happens there is that um the atomic number is dependent on the number of protons, right? So the the first element will clearly have one less proton than the other one so the proton is the answer for a radioactive substance with a particular half-life as time increases the radioactive substance obviously decreases because they, they will lo keep losing half um, particles right it's a kind of foolish question 
What did the Geiger mass in experiment establish as being present in the atom? Well, this is a nucleus because the experiment, they use a gold foil and they, um, they shot um, particles through the gold foil to see if it would be deflected. And most of them would not because they realized that the atom is just a bunch of empty spaces except for one um, part in the middle. So as they shot, sorry, as they shot things through, they realized only the things that passed through the nucleus actually went in an opposite direction. All these just passed through normal. Okay, so that was the Geiger Martin experiment. The atomic number and the mass number of an atom are 50 and 120 respectively. This means that in the atom, there will be 50 protons for sure because atomic number and proton number are the same and there will be 70 neutrons. So the mass number is made up of the protons and the neutrons. So if we know that there are 50 protons to find a neutron number, we just take away 50 from your mass number and you will get 70. On Sunday, the corrected count rate of, I don't know why they gave us the actual day, but um, was 240 counts. So exactly two days later, the count rate fall to 120, a half of 240. So that means our half-life is two days. Now, they want um, after exactly four days, four more days, right, in addition to the two days. So they don't want four days in total. They actually kind of want six days in total, right? The count rate was, so from 240, we went to 120 in two days, right? So therefore, another half-life would occur in another two days and go to 60. And then in another two days, it would half again. And finally, we would reach 30. Very simple question. Okay, so when a polythene rod is rubbed with a cloth, it becomes negatively charged by gaining electrons. So static electricity here, right? Very simple experiment. The role of a transformer in a circuit is obviously to alter the voltage. We just talked about um, step-down and step-up transformers, right? Um, to, the conversion is done by the diode, okay? Which of the following materials are conductors? So definitely not wood, right? So we have gold is a metal, so metals are good conductors. And finally, graphite is also a good non-metal conductor. So we have two and three. Fleming's left hand rule associates a quantity with each finger. So they want to know the. Um, so this is just something you have to learn, right? Which finger has which quantity. So the force is the thumb, um, the index finger is the field, and the second finger is the current. This is just something you have to know. However, they could also ask you for Fleming's right hand rule. So it's the same thing. They show the same thing except when you have to use the left hand and the right hand rule. So the left hand is, is used to find the direction of a magnetic force, while the right hand is used to find the direction of an induced current. So depending, you know, they could try to change up the question and ask something about the direction of the magnetic force, which, which rule you would use, whether it's the left or the right, you know, you might get a question like that. So just keep this in mind, right? Number 55. A student requires a circuit to measure the resistance of a resistor. Which of the following circuits below is correctly connected? So we need the voltmeter to, um, to measure the, the voltage, right? And the only way for voltmeters to work is that it needs to be in parallel to what it's trying to measure, right? So the voltage and the resistor here are in series, so that's wrong. Voltage and resistor in series as wrong. And finally, here we have them in parallel. So the answer is C, okay? Right, so 56 refers to the following. So, you know, this is the most foolish question in the entire paper. If the circuit is shown up in the circuit shown above, which of the lamps will be lit when the switch is closed? Well, there's only one switch for the entire circuit. So as soon as the switch is closed, all of the lamps will light. Right, it's very, very, very foolish question. <laughs> kind of obvious right so tq and r will all light item 57 refers to the following diagram which shows a coil carrying a current wrapped around a wooden cylinder this is called a solenoid right so they could skip this whole um this whole explanation and just see it is a solenoid right so just keep that in mind which rule 
of the table below shows the magnetic field directions at x, y, and z. So there's an invisible magnetic field flowing through this diagram. They kind of go like this. It's a very poor, um, poor way of drawing it, right? But the direction goes like this, right? You have to watch where the current is coming from. It's going in this direction, right? And it'll be like this, and then we'll have um, opposite kind of fields going like that okay so therefore at x you will have um, going in this direction and y will be in the opposite direction and then z will be you switch it back around again now you need to watch a diagram very carefully because they could put the this arrow over here instead and then put the down arrow on the opposite direction in that case your fields will be going in this direction now right like that and then these will come like that instead right so it'll be the opposite direction so just keep that in mind right look at your diagram very carefully okay we're almost done which of the following is not true when a magnet is moved relative to a coil so this is the interaction between magnets and the coils producing an emf so the emf is definitely proportional to the number of turns the more turns of coil you have the greater the induced emf so this is wrong right it's not smaller the faster the magnet moves relative to the coil the greater the induced emf yes this is correct right it produces a greater rate of change the stronger the magnetic field the greater the induced emf so this sounds right because it is right right so two and three is correct but they ask which of the following is not true so read your questions very carefully right so one is the answer because that is a false one they could easily change this question by simply asking which of the following is true and then it will be two and three right so don't get caught read carefully item 59 refers to the following diagram so this is something you need to know right so a will be positive here and b will be negative okay this is something you have to just learn and finally, we have a very easy radioactive question here. The radioactive decay of an isotope of radon is represented by the equation. The values of A and B, so this is essentially a maths question, right? So 220 is the original value. So if helium is 4 here, what would be A to make back to 220? It's clearly 216. So 216 plus 4 will give you back 220. Similarly, for the one on the bottom, 86 is the original number. And we have 2 here for helium. So B will simply have to be 84. 84 plus 2 is 86. So that's why B is our answer. However, they could simply change this up by putting in an electron, which is 0 or minus 1. Right? So that will change the maths a little bit, but same procedure. Or they could give you an alpha particle instead, which is the same as helium. Or they could give you a beta particle, which is the same as an electron. So keep that in mind, right? And that is 60 questions there from this multiple choice paper as you can see we did every single topic in the physics syllabus so once you understand these topics you have no problem in your multiple choice exam